So you're talking about just your fans are helping you make content because they're yep. so invested. I mean, is this? Do you think this is a sustainable development philosophy to get people to? Because I mean, we've seen it for years and years. I mean, Defense of the Ancients was just some dude who yep. made a mod. But I mean, is this something you think you can rely on for games? Is having like people in the community who are so invested that they almost help make the game they're looking forward to? Um, I think it's the future. And I think that's why Defense of the Ancients or League of Legends is one of the most... There's, it's not an accident that that game is so popular right now. It's gotten to the point where us as developers have been in the industry now almost 23, maybe 25 years, I can't count. But it's been a long time. And we're getting ideas now from gamers um, who have said, man, I love playing these games. I have this one idea. And the great thing is you have to think about... I, I kind of think of it as all in parallel, where in a typical traditional studio, you have 50 or 60 people that work in this hierarchy, maybe hundreds. And if it gets to thousands, it even gets harder to get all these things up the food chain to the director, to the associate producer, to the producer. All that stuff gets really hard. With this, it's just, here's my idea, what do you think? Here's my idea, what do you think? And then you've got community members organizing and saying, hey, these are the ones you guys should look at. And it happens, it's almost like this parallel taint. I, I like to think, I call it wetware because I really think it is like brain cells firing in parallel that just help you out. And to say to rely on it, I, I think that's good, but I, I would say use it as a tool. And um, I do think it's the future. I, I think League of Legends or games like Dota and stuff are the most popular right now, not by accident, because it's a natural um, evolvement of the gaming industry. And that's what's, I would say, the ult not the ultimate, but that's, that evolution came from real-time strategy, where people were saying, hey, you know what, doing all these armies is kind of cool, but I'd rather just focus on one, and I want some light role-playing elements, and now I want something what I would equate to like tennis, where I want this board, and I want, I want to know, hey, you know, this character's MIA in, in mid, or I, I, want, I want solo top, I don't want to be support. But all of these things are getting really much like a sport, and it, and it evolved, and I think other genres can go that way too. And when it comes to Lovecraft, I'm a huge fan of. If you think about Lovecraft, the first thing he did was spread his stories out there and say, everyone else pitch in. And in some sense, we're hearkening back to his, his which is you know, almost 200 years old now, let's do the same thing. Let's, let's contribute. Let's join, uh, join what we're doing. Join the order. Contribute to this content. Help make this universe. It'll be an experience that you might have found. And even if you're not creative, just give your comments out whether you like it or not, and that'll help too. Okay. So uh, a lot of people have talked about how AAA development isn't sustainable because it costs eighty million dollars, and you have to sell yep. a preposterous amounts to, to make money. Is this? Do you think this is a way by having the community help to to sustain extend the life of AAA, or do you think AAA just might be going down a road that has no happy ending, or do you think it's fine? Uh, AAA is not fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would I would equate so you asked several good questions here so let me let me answer the first I think our industry now is in a position exactly where Hollywood was in the early 20s and in the golden era of films where they're making movies like Cleopatra or Ben-Hur where everyone was an employee and they had thousands of staff and they made fantastic movies those were great movies I still watch them today they're amazing but the studios looked at them and said we're not making money this is not working and then those studios didn't disappear, and it's not to say that it's going to be over for EA or you know, any of these studios. They're still going to be around. Don't, I, I don't think anyone should kid themselves about that. But what did happen is they changed the way they worked, and they went towards more like the model of we have, where you have, like I would call, like a studio, either a micro studio or a very focused studio that grows and expands, but are not employees of this one group, where basically it's not internal development, because it's much more efficient that way. And I think that's where AAA may go, or at least game development may go. Now, as far as the second question you asked where you said, are we going to rely on this to help out AAA? I don't think AAA is of a makeup that they could even interact with the community like we do. I think it's too difficult. You have to be very, you need buy-in from the top down. That would mean everyone who owns these companies, like say, I won't even say a company, whatever this large company is, um, it's better not to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can imagine who you're talking yes. about. So, but they would have to buy in from the ground up that they're going to be posting on the forums. And I just don't think that's realistic. So I think it's going to be very tough for um, them to get bought into the community. Most of these larger companies have community managers that 
keep the community at bay, where we have community managers that are harnessing the creativity. And to answer the last question, could they use it to save the day? Um, we're, when we started doing this initiative to work with the community, we didn't know where it was going to go, but the goal was to make the game better, not to save us time or to, you know, have, we had, like, as an idea, what, as an example, what's going on now? We have people creating Elder Gods. It was one of the things we opened up. So we have this thing called the Alienonic Rosette that's basically got the cosmology for our game. <laughs> and you should look at it. It's really cool. Recommend it. <laughs> And then we have nine elder gods where we have sigils, and we said, let's create some of these. And so out of the blue, people started jumping in right away. Very, very popular. And then out of the blue, we had someone go, hey, who wants concepts for their elder gods or their eternals? I'll create them. Then suddenly we have concept artists start contributing. And it's amazing, but it's not, you can't rely on that stuff. Yeah. At the end of the day, you can only hope it happens because some of the initiatives we do may not be as successful. But... Um, you can use it to make your game better, and I think that's the tool that you use if it can be harnessed. So I think for um, you know the kind of tier that we're shooting for, which is definitely not AAA, definitely not um, you know very typical um, crowdsource game, where because we have much higher production value, we're in that middle tier that people are thinking that's gone extinct. And quite frankly, in many ways they have. But let's bring that back. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. That's the goal. So, the, I mean, the one company that comes to mind as far as, like, being great with the community is Valve. Yeah. Who have, I mean, you can make hats, and then Valve gets money, and you get money. And it's like this system that, that seems to work and benefit everyone. Is that, is that like, can anyone else do that model? Or is it just because Valve is, has, they're, they're just in this place where they're untouchable, basically? Well, Valve has managed to create, um, in my opinion, a ecosystem in a delivery system, they've essentially created a console that's software-based right now. And um, hats off to them, because <laughs> Steam's pretty amazing. Um, I think they can only do that because of their delivery system. I, I think it's possible for a studio like us maybe to do that, but it'd be much, much more difficult. Um, so uh, it's hard to tell with Valve. It's always, it's when you're looking at, um, when you're trying to see where the trends are going, looking at companies like Valve, Valve that are just doing so well, and they're they're so they're such an outlier. It's really difficult. I'm I'm always particularly cautious of saying, um, a Valve has done so many things right. Uh, it's hard to tell when they're doing something wrong right now because yeah. they're just they're just doing so well. But one of the things that's interesting, uh, there's not another company that's like Valve. Like it was founded by a rich dude, uh, so it doesn't have stockholders, and they just kind of do their own thing. Like, how come nobody else has even tried to follow this model? Oh, I think I think they have, but well, it requires a rich dude. It car yes, yeah. it requires a rich, it requires dude, a rich dude who's very to, smart also. Who's, that's very smart and wants to make games. Yes. So now we've gotten to a pretty small pool. Yeah. Um, and um, then someone who is brave enough to allow a flash structure, which he has. I, my hats off, hat, hats off, hats off <laughs> okay. to Gabe. He's amazing. Um, I don't know. I I don't know if we're going to see another Gabe Newell in our industry. It's really hard to tell. I would say it is unlikely. I think he's like one in a billion, and he's done some things that are amazing. And um, I look, I'm looking forward to see what he does next. Um, I think, I think one of the, I think one of the biggest lessons we've learned is trying to do other things that people are doing. Like if you look at what we're doing, it's very, very different than many other Kickstarters. Um, when we first started out, we thought the road to success was to emulate what these other successful Kickstarters were. Not a good idea. What was what was what were you emulating specifically? Um, terms of service was one. We just looked at terms of service, said this is how they did. It. That's what we'll do. It will save some time. Uh, no, bad idea. People did not like the terms of service for for whatever reason. Um, I also think um, uh, describing things in the way that we did them it just didn't work. And I think it's just because we're so different. We have to sort of look at it and go. We have to get our story out there. I think that's the true key. Get your story about what you want to do and why you're so passionate, and that's the success to Kickstarter. If there is a, a, a any kind of you know theory or formula for success, and hopefully, and if it if it doesn't happen, you know whatever. But at least we tried. We're excited about it, and I know uh, everyone at Precursor. It is without question a labor of love. So. So last year, Kotaku had uh, a pretty damning article. It was it contained about eight anonymous sources who talked about 
what it was like working on X-Men. Yeah. When you have anonymous sources, you're the only, the only thing that you can do is just come out and deny them. And we really seriously did not think people would take them as credible. But what we underestimated, I guess, is the churn of technology and the number of links and relinks and links and relinks that slowly builds up this credibility. You're just like, people actually think that this happened. 